leading up to the initial release of Cyberpunk 2077, I had this premonition that the game would be bad. I had nothing really to support this. I hardly followed the marketing and had no real anticipation for the game other than I thought it looked neat and would like it to be good. While the numerous delays weren't a good sign, hey, modern AAA games are delayed all the time, so maybe this was much ado about nothing. The only other time I had this gut feeling about a game at the time was No Man's Sky, and... Then finally came release day in December 2020, and... How bad we talking? I and the entire leadership team are deeply sorry for this. While I somewhat felt responsible for this outcome, I was not going to miss the opportunity to clown the game at launch and for the next year. My interest in the franchise perked up again though with the advent of the Edge Runners anime series which is a great piece of character exploration, world building, and stunning animation. I thought if the game is anything like this then maybe it was worth a shot. But the game was still not in a state at the time for me to bother touching it. Another year passed and with the release and acclaim of the Phantom Liberty expansion and 2.0 update I was finally ready to give the game a swing. I got the game for my birthday, and after a first run with over 100 hours of playtime, I can say that Cyberpunk 2077 has ruined my life. I have not been this immersed in a world, invested in a group of characters, and emotionally gripped in a narrative from not just a video game, but any piece of media in years. Early on, I knew this game had me when all I could think about when I wasn't playing it was getting back to playing it as soon as possible. I could practically see Johnny Silverhand tell me to get off my ass, to leave work, and stop contributing to corporate colonialism. Cyberpunk had me in its grip just like its setting has its grip on all those who inhabit it. Night City is a practically living megaopolis. A towering beauty that's figuratively and literally been built atop an ugly underbelly of its own making. A concrete jungle where if you're not sucked into the callous, inhuman, mega-corporate machine, you're struggling to survive on the ground against numerous vile gangs. Night City is a prison of opportunity and dreams. A challenge where you seemingly have two options. Punch back or give in and succumb to the weight of the beast. I think the most dejecting aspect of Night City is that it presents itself as this Eden of hope when in reality it's an environment that makes everyone feel so small and alone. Genuine human connection is disregarded for solitary gain. People just trying to make it by our pawns in the corporate ladder so someone else can climb over them. People crowing up to the point of foregoing their humanity in order to be a step ahead of everyone else. Explicit products constantly being sold to you as your problem solver, but they're never enough. This is the daily struggle of people living in Night City, trying to find a home in a place that doesn't want to accept them. The city of endless potential, endless possibilities. The city that was a lie. The incredible art direction also illuminates this. The details around every corner of Night City tell a story along with every NPC walking through the streets. Everyone you pass feels like they've lived a life and have their own story they're the star of. It's all of this that makes Night City feel so alive and all-encompassing of a world to explore. But it's who you tread the neon streets of NC as that makes that journey all the more enthralling. I'm honestly shocked how much I love V as a protagonist. I expected V to be more of a surrogate for the player, but no. V is very much your own character. Even if you choose that V be more compassionate or aggressive, they all still feel like V, and I think that's the mark of stellar writing. The voice performances from Sheremy Lee and Gavin Drea are both terrific. They both bring something different to the table and give you a great reason to play both genders of V. But I'm Team Fem V here, so she's gonna be repping this video. Next time, male V. You fucking owe me big. V is such a well-rounded character. The perfect balance of backbone, snark. I can break your jaw, fracture your skull, shoot you. The possibilities are endless. Humor, Two charm. Moves. And amaze balls. Compassion, flaws, like and vulnerability. I just want the world to know I was here. That I mattered. 
you just can't help but latch on to V immediately and grow more and more attached to her as the story progresses. I just became so invested in V's struggle to survive. After coming to Night City for a new beginning and starting at rock bottom, she finally has the chance to really start living, but it's taken away. She loses her best friend in Jackie, and now has a ticking time bomb in her head, erasing her mind from her body. A slow death of her soul and identity with no apparent cure, and the story becomes a fight to not go quietly into that good night. I was really taken by V feeling the weight of death linger over her. I snuffed it once, and I'm gonna do it all over again. Got no idea how to stop it. Death is something I think about a lot, and I really relate to how Cyberpunk explores that. V? Yeah? Are you not afraid to die? I am. All the fucking time. It's one of the rare times playing a game I desperately did not want a character to die, and I would genuinely stress about it while playing. What makes V's journey all the more engaging are the numerous characters she meets and the stories she takes part in. The writing in Cyberpunk 2077 is on another level. I have a very analytical mode whenever I experience a piece of art, but Cyberpunk is one of the rare times when that part of my brain was turned off and I was completely immersed in the characters and their stories. I wasn't thinking about character arcs and thematic development. The dialogue is so natural that the characters seem like real people at points. I mean, you know, ugh, it's so fucking hard to say, especially to you. People with a wealth of history that has led them to the moment you meet them and they act accordingly. I fell in love with so many characters in this game. Jackie, Judy, Pan Am, Takamura, Victor, Misty, Carrie, Rogue, Somi, Reed, Alex, and so many more. Even characters with more minor roles and one-time NPCs are super memorable. Every character feels wholly unique in their own way and had so much care and effort put into them. The relationship building is one of the most emotionally satisfying aspects of the storytelling. You have to be guarded living in Night City because it's dangerous to let people in. And you must be... Valerie? V. Just V. Only people who know me real well can use my real name. Each character V meets is slow to trust at first. Most relationships start off as strictly business, and a few more so for V as factors can also lead to saving her life. But the more these stories further, they grow to become more personal, and with that, the more these characters let their guard down and let you in. Why are you showing me this? It's important to me. While V's time is limited, her taking the time to lend a helping hand means a lot to her newfound friends and companions, especially in Night City where people you can truly trust are hard to come by. The core storylines outside the main quest all explore the foremost struggles of Night City, and by association, V's innermost struggles. Judy's questline delves into fighting against a system you try to topple by its own rules. The hardest part is working in a flawed system where you do something you love so you try to make it work, but the machine is slowly killing your passion. You want to change the system for the better, but the system is just too deep and ingrained to be totally altered, so maybe the best thing you can do for yourself is just leave the system. Judy's storyline is terrific and includes one of my favorite levels in the whole game with her taking V on an underwater tour of her old and now sunken hole in town. It's this beautiful swell of emotion with V and Judy experiencing each other's memories. I think the sequence wonderfully illustrates how the melancholy of remembering the past can be washed away by the comfort of someone you care for grounding you in the present. Pan Am's questline is about the struggle of being part of a family. The pressure of having responsibility, being self-critical, and trying to find middle ground where there are disagreements. But despite all that, the glowing feeling of when you finally have the right family, how good it is to belong to something. To not have a place where you can call home, but a group of people you can call home. If I had to pick, Pan Am is probably my favorite supporting character in the whole game. V and her just have instant chemistry. We need to outfox them, then get to my car somehow. Relax, got a few ideas. I'll try to play a little game with them at the intersection. Hell yes. As soon as they see the lights, they'll have to check who, why, and how. Nova. Yep. Pan Am wears all she is on her sleeve. I appreciate how a character as strong-willed as Pan Am can still feel so much insecurity and overcome that. Then when she lets someone she trusts in, she will do anything and everything for you, showing what it means to devote yourself to being loyal. Then there's Carrie Uridine's questline, how after decades of success and adulation, you can still wake up feeling that there's something missing. Carrie has everything anyone could want, and yet, there's still this hole inside him, as if he's living in a shadow. His success owed to others. Wake up with the same thought every damn day. That I might somehow fade into this town's steam, stench, murk, for good. When V comes into Carrie's life, it sparks something in him, but he directs his energy into finding an enemy. A hot new pop band he thinks is riding his coattails, performing one of his songs, and ruining it from his point of view. In his attempt to sabotage them, he realizes they're both just being played by corporates to profit off of them. 
Carrie questions whether he's his own artist or just another corporate product. V is still that spark that reminds him that that rocker boy is still inside and he finds it in himself to be that rebel again and break free. Realize he's the reason for his success. It inspires Carrie not only to create again, but collaborate. To stop being bitter and embrace change. Carrie's storyline shows how it's possible to escape from under the boot of blood-sucking corporations. No one's battle against corporate fascism is stronger though than the man of the hour. Blinding lights. It's loud. I'm on stage and I almost can't breathe. I'm so damn full of hatred. And then I let it all out into a mic and I realize it didn't help. I don't feel any better. I've somehow made it this far into the video without mentioning one of, if not the most important pieces to this game. V and Johnny's relationship is something the writing and performances really needed to thread the needle on. Johnny's engram is slowly killing V and will eventually erase her identity entirely. It's this invasive mental horror that constantly eats away at V. Honestly, I'm scared of the day I'll start seeing your memories as my own. Will I notice the change? Or is it one of those things where I'll wonder why I ever feared it? Methodically losing control until her mind fades away and someone else will wear her face. I really hated Johnny from the jump. Immediately he tries to kill V, and even when he changes his tune, he's still fueled by decades old hatred and admits if push comes to shove, he will take V's body if she doesn't comply. What makes all this work though in the end is the casting of Keanu Reeves. You're breathtaking! I have to say, I think this is the best performance of Reeves' career. It's surreal seeing him get to chew on the best dialogue he's ever had written for him. Johnny has so many extensive monologues and Keanu knocks all of them dead. Through all the trials and tribulations V and Johnny have early on, I could never totally hate Johnny because Keanu's charm oh, would always shine smile. through. No. Oh no, Johnny. Fuck off, please. You missed me. Warms the cockles. Truly. Then as the narrative slowly peels back the layers on Johnny's past, we see that Johnny really does care about people. He just could never earnestly show it. Johnny always acts like he thinks big picture in the war against capitalistic corporations, but at the end of the day, his bombing of Arasaka Tower is more about avenging what Arasaka did to Alta than liberating the masses. Johnny was afraid to let people truly in, and now he's in a situation where he can't escape. He's inside V's head, and their minds are slowly becoming one. Their memories and identities merging. With that, V and Johnny periodically learn to empathize and learn from each other, but also keep each other honest. There are times when V will start to waver and lose faith that she can be saved and Johnny will tell her to keep fighting. Got no idea where I'm going. Be a living legend. <laughs> That's all I wanted. Feels like I'm barely surviving. Test of a person's true value? Death. Facing it. Staring it down. You still got a chance to be somebody. Then when Johnny's self-esteem starts to dip when he's questioning his legacy, V lifts him back up. Better now? A bit. But let's say it was my real grave. What would you write? Here lies Johnny Silverhand. The guy who saved my life. V, you don't know how much I want that to be true. The biggest growing period of the story for V and Johnny is when Johnny wants to reconnect with Rogue again, but that means V will have to give Johnny control of her body. It's a point where their trust is truly put to the test. Johnny acts disgustingly irresponsible when V first grants him control of her body. Johnny indulges in his old habits and is gross to watch. I'm of two minds on the sequences where Johnny pilots V's body because most of the time you have control of Johnny or have to enact his prompts at least. Part of me thinks it would have been more impactful for you to lose control of V totally. Johnny's his own character and should say and act as he pleases, and we can't do anything to stop him. It would put the player more in V's shoes for sure. Not being able to do anything as Johnny does as he pleases. On the other hand though, us having to act out Johnny's actions makes us feel like an active participant in his choices, so we're even more conscious of what he's doing in V's body. It puts into perspective our responsibility of control and how it affects other people. Johnny himself soon realizes this and discovers how much his actions have unintended consequences. Not only how his presence is really fueling V's suffering, but how his choices 50 years ago affected the likes of Rogue and Carrie and how it still affected them to this day. Johnny's ego was finally shattered after seeing all this vain bombing of Arasaka Tower got him was an unmarked grave in the middle of nowhere. 
you finally understand where he's most remembered is among those who truly cared about him. In a questline that started with Johnny wanting revenge against Adam Smasher, it ends with Johnny getting a chance to perform one last time with Samurai through V. This allows Johnny to finally put to rest his past life and focus on what's really important, saving V's life. It's an amazing feat how this game takes Johnny from an incredibly selfish character who actively friends V's autonomy to a true friend who grows to want what's best for V without accomplishing his own desires. Of all the heads I could have popped up in, hella glad it was yours. Ooh, I love this song. For as overwhelmingly bleak as this game can be, it still has its moments of levity and fun. I enjoyed the zany side quest adventures Night City had to offer. For as dark and complex as side quests like Sinner Man and the Paralysis Story are, there's a bunch of outlandish quests to even the playing field. From Brendan the Vending Machine, to Flaming Crotch Guy, to Ozob, to Gary the Prophet. While some of these stories still have their touches of tragedy to them, they're much needed goofy interactions that are a nice change of pace. But more key are the moments you share with V's closest friends. After tragic losses and deep personal turmoil, the moments when you can not only emotionally open up, but let loose and enjoy the moment are so important. You take in every second of them because you don't know when they'll come again. Don't hear anything about it right now. Take down all of this is jaded somehow. It's not me. A chunk of the game where moments of joy are even fewer and far between though is Cyberpunk 2077's ultimate ace in the hole. V? Can you hear me? My name is Somi, and I can save your life. From the jump, Phantom Liberty corrects one key element I wish was more prevalent in the base game, more cinematic set piece oriented level design. While there are some solid set pieces in the base game like the downy of Hellman's AV and the parade sequence, Phantom Liberty takes things to the next level. Shit, the opening sequence alone is phenomenal. Save the president. Sure. What fucking problem? We go from Somi introducing us to Dogtown, to Space Force 1 being shot out of the sky, to racing through the streets and battling through militia forces to reach the president, to getting beat up by the president, to avoiding apprehension and making your way through a museum, to a game best sprawling epic boss battle with the Chimera. There's such a distinct identity to this DLC and it only becomes more prevalent the deeper you delve in. Sheesh, don't know what to believe just yet. Phantom Liberty is a spy thriller, from government conspiracies and corruption, secret agent companions that keep their cards close to the chest, infiltrating an extravagant party filled with a who's who of Night City's upper brass and celebrities, Mission Impossible-like doppelganger masks, and an isolated militia-controlled city run by a Bond-esque villain. Shit, the end credits are literally just a James Bond-inspired opening credit sequence. As fun as it is to have V play Super Spy, there quickly becomes this sense of dread as the story progresses. Reed, I needn't remind you what this means for the NUS's national security. Pass it on to President Myers. Her toy of mass destruction is my friend now. Songbird is still my people, and nothing can change that. It fucked everything up. I know V, but I had no choice. That's the tragedy, V. Someone's gonna play victim to the other's good intentions. Sobe and Solomon Reed are in the yin and yang of Phantom Liberty. While many compare Somi and Reed's relationship to V and Johnny's, I view them as more as external representations of V herself, two extreme sides of the same coin. Somi, like V, is dying and desperate to find a means of survival, not only dying but sharing the same fate with the death of her soul. The black wall slowly chipping away at Somi's memories and what are we without our memories? But what did my mom's voice sound like? After spending years under President Myers in the FIA as a weapon and being poisoned by the Black Ball, Somi is willing to do whatever it takes to escape. V heavily sympathizes with all that, but is it real? 
so many pitches beyond two dying souls coming together to gain their survival, but is it all honest or manipulation? The question also becomes how far is too far? Somi has a history of making big gambles. Will this be the one that reaps the most consequences? On the other side of the equation is Reed, very openly a man of principles and loyalty. A man who feels an incredible amount of responsibility for those under his wing, but also in his own view, a dead man walking. After spending seven years in Dogtown after being forced to take the fall in the name of peace, he's left with nothing but his call to action. After seven years, his call has finally come. Save Somi from the grasp of Kurt Hansen and return her to the FIA. With Reed being Somi's partner and mentor for years, he feels responsible for doing right by her. But he's not doing this for Somi's sake, but for the sake of the NUSA. To cover up them breaking international law by trying to weaponize the Black Wall, Reed is doing his damnest to do what he believes is the right thing. As a friend, but also for pride and country. That mutually exclusive friendship and duty. Matter of fact, they are. V in a similar respect feels that burden of responsibility. After the death of Jackie, she does everything in her power to do right by people she's grown to care for. But now she's in a predicament involving two parties racing in opposite directions. For all your good intentions, there is no clear solution to making everyone happy. I believe the ultimate X factor in Phantom Liberty though is Alex. While she skews more towards Reed's side due to circumstances, Alex is the middle point between Somi and Reed. Alex desires the same freedom as Somi from the FIA, but hasn't mustered up the urge to strive for it. Like Reed, she's waiting for that call to action, but unlike Reed, when it's all over, she doesn't want to be accepted back by the FIA, but retire from it. Enjoy her life. One of my favorite scenes from the game is when Alex invites V to the moth and she talks about her dreams of becoming an actor. While Somi is fighting for a chance to survive and Reed will continue to work for the FIA no matter what, Alex has other desires in life. I grew to really love Alex and for me she totally evened the playing field when it comes to the first consequential choice in Phantom Liberty. Okay, your turn. It's ready for the access codes. When I first made it to the initial decision to side with Somi or Reed, I was stumped. I literally had to pause the game and go make lunch so I can think over this choice. I definitely was leaning more towards Somi at first, but I still very much sympathize and liked Reed. But in spite of his offer to help Somi without the FIA's interference, I still didn't trust him. But if I betrayed Reed, that also meant I betrayed Alex. Shit. Now imagine me thinking about this as I'm eating chicken tenders or whatever I was eating that day. Ultimately though, I decided to side with Somi just because it felt right. I love this entire end path sequence. V and Somi are literally this us against the world duo fighting through everything for their survival. The trudge of the orbital station is absolutely spectacular. With Somi suffering from the corruption of the black wall, V has to be her crutch carrying both of them to the promised land. Everything escalates to where the FIA infiltrate the orbital station and start battling with airport security. V and Somi's desire to live has practically started a war. The two have to will their way through a battlefield and to cap it all off, V harnessing the power of the black wall through Somi and using it to combat enemies in their way is as haunting as it is exhilarating. When V and Somi have their moment to rest on a train, it feels like they've never been closer. Sisters in arms battling a war so they can live. It's only fitting when they're at their closest that Somi finally admits the truth. Neural Matrix V can only be used once. What? After everything V has done to get both of them to this point, she can, on the doorstep of Somi's last hope to heal herself, take that away from her. Maybe she'd be totally justified in doing so. Somi lied to V, gave her false hope that they could both be saved. All Somi does is harm those around her. She doesn't deserve a second chance. It is a justifiable choice to hand her over to Reed and have Somi live out her days serving the FIA as penance. But it's not right. I knew from the start Somi was likely leading V on a false promise, but it didn't matter because I wanted to help her on her terms. Whatever dicey chances Somi has of being able to recover on the moon is far better than suffering the rest of her life as an FIA weapon. After everything V has done for Somi, how could she turn back now? So, what do you want to do? With Reed not being able to see the forest through the trees, he can't look past his principles and what he thinks is the right thing, and you have no choice but to put him down. Fuck. The last obstacle in Somi's path to a true second chance is the man who always thought he knew what was best for her. V watches with Johnny as the shuttle takes off and with that, the best chance for V's survival. But I ultimately think that this is the best ending to Phantom Liberty. 
As much of a shame as it is to have to kill Reed, giving Somi a chance at a new life is the most selfless act by V in the entire game. Hope she ends up happy. She's free. Slammed at home. Plus, Alex lives on this path and thankfully gets her second chance. It may not be a happy ending for all, but I left my first playthrough of Phantom Liberty feeling like I did the right thing. Then there's the other side of the coin. If you choose to compromise and side with Reed when retrieving the Neural Matrix. This choice absolutely breaks Somi and sends her over the edge. There's nothing left for Somi to latch onto for hope and the black ball has its opening to start consuming her fully. The one person she trusted to understand her struggle breaks that trust. The consequences of this compromise immediately begin to rear their head. Alex is killed, and as satisfying as it is to whoop Hansen's ass personally and avenge Alex, you as a player know that this didn't have to happen. Somi, after her rampage, is eventually apprehended by Max Tack. While planning the ambush, doubt starts to creep in. For all V and Reed's best intentions, are they doing the right thing, or has their desire for control drove Somi past the point of no return? Even in your attempt to rescue Somi from Max Tack, she still can't accept your help. This leads V into the site of the original sin. Alone, V has to fight through the power of the Black Wall to save Somi's soul. Along the way, Somi bombards V at resistance. But how much of this is her, the Black Wall itself, or the Black Wall pulling these words from deep inside Somi? V encounters Somi's memories being extracted by the Black Wall. The building blocks of the isolated Somi were striving to save now. There's still this constant nagging at the back of your neck. Are you doing the right thing even now? If there's anything persistent in this path of Phantom Liberty, it's doubt. That questioning lingers until Somi finally lets it be in. Somi's Mind Palace is one of the best sequences in the entire game. Somi's old Brooklyn apartment uses the Tesseract housing all her comfort and regret. The happiest moments of her youth and how she let their future potential slip away and for what? Thinking she was doing the best for everyone by joining the FIA? All Somi's left with is regret for the choices methodically being taken away from her. The emptiness grows. I feel it. Fill it with memories. They keep taking them away. It all circles back around to V robbing Somi of her best chance of a second life. I gave myself one last chance, and you stripped me of it. Why? Somi, I... Back then... I thought I was making the right call. The right one? Whom for? You? Reed? Everyone involved. One -win decision After everything we've seen, there is no perfect solution. V finally understands that. As the Black Wall makes its final push to fully overtake Somi, all V can do is what she should have done before. Be there for Somi when she needs it the most. Then comes likely the most devastating choice in all of Cyberpunk 2077. V finally reaches Somi, but it's seemingly too late. The Black Wall has taken too much from Somi, and she begs you to help her with her only means of escape. This is where all V's best intentions for everyone leads, and she has one last chance to give Somi what she wants. An escape. As much as you don't want to do this, you know the alternative. Forcing Somi to return to being a hustless weapon for the FIA. Devoid of any humanity and an empty shell to be used at the whims of tyrant authorities. As devastating as it is, the only way out is to release Somi from that fate. Freedom. You deserve it, Somi. Well, I'll do it. I'll keep this moment as this memory. Just one. Back home, a friend at my side. Before it all goes dark. For one last second, I'll know I wasn't alone. You. And, and I'm sorry for everything. I find where Reed ends up after each path really fascinating. Whatever grasp of control he has over the situation leads to a different endpoint for him. 
whether it's losing all control of the fate of Somi and his ideals resulting in his demise, to finding the will to seek freedom if he loses Somi, to feeling that the ends justify the means if he can help Somi on his terms. Even then, there's always this feeling of regret which is what going down the path of siding with Reed leads. All he wants to do is make up for his past mistakes, but in trying to rectify them, he just makes things worse. And we both have to pay the price. Did his mistakes only start at the beginning of this story, or were the seeds planted the moment he met Somi? If he lives, those questions will haunt Reed for the rest of his life. V is a chance to fall down that same path, and if she does, that results in coming face to face with everything that Somi and Reed suffered from. But I'll wait to delve into that more later. Phantom Liberty is a phenomenal expansion, not only correcting some hiccups from the base game, but weaving in a multi-layered story about remorse and control, and whether you can look past them in order to do the right thing, or succumb to them further, is one of the best writing efforts I've ever seen in a video game. That sense of choice and consequence is no greater though than in your fateful final choice in this game. So what? What did Jackie decide up here? Oh, you know. Gonna be a legend in this city. And I'm gonna leave you alone now. Take your time. The ending of Cyberpunk 2077 stared me dead in the face for quite some time. Part of me just didn't want the game to end. I was intentionally padding my time. Whenever a side quest I hadn't gotten to yet would trigger just as I was mustering up the urge to do the ending, I got excited because that meant another fun adventure or good storyline with great characters to interact with. Another part of me just didn't want to say goodbye to V. I had grown so attached to her and I knew this was a game where no matter what the ending was, it wasn't going to be a happy ending and I just wasn't ready to face that yet. Another part of me just wasn't too thrilled about the prospect of multiple endings. Usually games with multiple endings just feel gimmicky for me, and I much prefer all effort going into making one great ending. For Cyberpunk, I never heard much chatter about the ending, so I had no frame of reference for expectations. That may have been for the best, because holy fucking shit, I have never been more wrong about something gaming related in my life. The endings to Cyberpunk 2077 are all phenomenal. Final levels that are all vastly different from pre-mission setup to companions you bring along with you into the siege to how the reactions differ to similar events that transpire, and the aftermath of V's fate inside Mikoshi blew me away. I'm sure there are other games out there that accomplish similar feats, but I personally have never been this taken aback by a multiple ending game before. Each ending is not only valid in their own right, but flat out necessary. Each closing touches on themes of the game from their own unique perspective and builds this complete whole for the messages of the narrative. It's so impressive to me how the writers at CDPR use each ending individually and together bouncing off each other to wrap up the themes of the story in an emotionally satisfying and devastating fashion. The main goal of Night City is to get you to give in to its overwhelming forces. Corporate manipulation, cybernetic dehumanization, or forgoing all your ties keeping you grounded to becoming a legend. The first two endings I finished explored these ideas. Through the V and Johnny secret final mission, I first experienced the Sun ending, and at first I ironically didn't feel much playing this ending. I couldn't exactly wrap my mind around it at first. Then I played the Johnny and Rogue final mission next and chose the Temperance ending, where Johnny chooses to keep V's body, and fuck that broke me. I completed these two endings late at night and didn't sleep long before I woke up and what these endings were really about sunk in for me and it was an absolute mess. I genuinely cried as I pondered the implication of these endings. The decision you make and how you choose to approach the final mission determines how V receives the news that she only has 6 months to live after she was too late in stopping Johnny's engram from taking over her body. In these endings we see the consequences of V and Johnny as well seeking to prioritize their legend status in Night City above all else. In the Sun ending, V seemingly has everything she could ever want and desired at the start of the story. More Eddies than God, a beautiful home, someone she loves she can wake up next to, the moniker of Queen of the Afterlife, and a legend of Night City, and yet, it's still not enough. There's still something missing, a hole V longs to fill. All this effort and where has V ultimately ended up? Across the street? There's this silent call from Night City that V needs to answer and it leads to her growing more distant from those closest to her. In the limited time V has left, she's become this cold and empty shell of a person that has become unrecognizable to those closest to her. Who are you? I... I don't know. Get a little lost when I look inside. I'm stronger than ever, but I... I can't seem to keep my mind straight. 
How do you feel? Bitter, I guess. And sad. V only fell deeper into the numbing grip of Night City. This all didn't become clear to me though until after I played the Temperance ending. Firstly though, in all the final choices besides the Devil ending, you can choose to have V join Alt and go beyond the Blackwell to become pure immortal data. This choice is V being too afraid to face her mortality and choosing everlasting life in cyberspace. It's a despairing end as we see how this has affected Alt in her digital form. Seeing cyberspace is totally preferable to life in the physical world, but at the cost of her soul. In that, it's similar to the devil ending where you can choose to have V sign her life away to Arasaka and willingly enter Makoshi in the hope that Arasaka may one day find a compatible home for her so she can live once again. Both choices are depressing in that V has fought this whole time to gain back her autonomy, but in the end she chooses to give her life over to forces and concepts that don't care about what makes a person human. In an effort to hold on to life so tightly, V has chosen to surrender a key thing that gives her life purpose. Her soul. Circling back to the Temperance ending, I think it's even more devastating to choose to give Johnny V's body as you control Johnny inside Makoshi. You lied to me from the start. It's an absolute gut punch. You betray the person you've been fighting to save the whole game and betray yourself at the same time. It's heartbreaking to see V in real time process what's happening. Jeremy Lee's shattering performance here stayed with me for a long time after playing. There are no options, you two-faced sack of shit! You're out, I'm in! That was the deal! Listen, Johnny, I'm glad we met, got to know each other, and I'm sorry. I don't want to die. Who does? I just don't see a way out. Just promise me one thing, asshole. You won't forgive me. When you assume control of Johnny sometime later, his story is one of the most impactful stretches in the entire game. While I hate this ending on face value, it's truly an exceptional piece of writing and completes Johnny's character arc even further. We see him finally realize his true value as a person. Johnny mentors a young man and genuinely tries to set him on the right path. What really startled me was something totally coincidental. While Steve is wearing V's favorite shirt as this subtextual way to communicate V mentoring Johnny because he sees a lot of V in him, with how I customized my V, she ended up looking very similar to Steve to the point that I thought the developers programmed Steve that way. I found out later that wasn't the case, but that happenstance only furthered my emotional state while playing. In a way, Johnny guiding Steve is his final goodbye to V. In another life, he helped someone correct their life and learn from his failures when he couldn't in the end with V if you chose this ending. Johnny finally decides to put to rest his and V's life in Night City and leave to find a new home. Johnny finally accepts his way of combating the corporate machine in Night City would never lead to the change he sought and was only a means to fuel his ego and spread his legend. He finally sees that he can never dent the likes of Arasaka. You can't just blow up your problems and be remembered forever. What did Johnny's fight against Arasaka get him in the grand scheme of Night City? A drink at the afterlife and the nostalgic fan selling memorabilia to make ends meet? Those who remember Johnny the most are the ones that still miss him. Rogue and Carrie. The same applies to V. V's greatest fear is feeling like she never existed. In the sun ending, she tries so hard to carve her name in history, but it's an empty quest when everything she was longing for was right there in front of her the whole time. Hey V. The end credits messages from your friends and companions are so key. Experiencing these endings first, it's so bittersweet because whether it's V striving to become a legend or entering cyberspace, her friends still remember her and love her for how she helped them. These messages are even more impactful though if you choose to enact the suicide ending. No, there's no fucking point. I mean, she... The scene really hit me hard as I've suffered from depression and have had suicidal thoughts myself, and seeing all those who care for V be devastated and angry by her choice really hit me hard. I just wish I had done more. So things might have come out different. Just to even think about, you know... What happens? What were you thinking, huh? Or did you think about nothing at all? Is that it? You thought this would solve everything, didn't you? I don't think... I don't think you knew just how many friends you really had. I imagine them as my family members and friends if I had ever decided that life was just too much for me. V's struggle with self-worth is something I heavily related to. Am I worth their sacrifice? But we all have people that love us and appreciate the effort we give. If you have people that care for you and love you, then you will never be forgotten. V extinguished that fear long before the critical final choice. She just had to accept it sooner. Tension 
<laughs> if I had to pick a favorite end sequence, it would actually be the devil ending. In V's well-intentioned efforts to protect those she cares for from a desperate assault on Arasaka Tower, she falls into the cold, uncaring possession of a corporate monolith. V figuratively sells her soul to Hanako Arasaka, and she ends up stripping her of exactly that. Without all to properly split V and Johnny inside Mikoshi, V falls into Arasaka's grip as an experiment. With V and Johnny practically becoming one by the end of the Arasaka coup, their scientists, without care, tear Johnny's engram away from V, and with that, a large part of herself is missing. I feel empty. Emma, am I still V? Within Arasaka's orbital lab, V is in a similar situation to her life in Night City. She's dealt cards to a game that are not in her favor, forced to play by rules that act against her. Hope is dangled in front of V, but it's just out of reach. It's a microcosm of the struggle of Night City, a phantom reward at the finish line. All you have to do is solve the puzzle, but the pieces keep changing. Even if you manage to solve the riddle, the reward is all the same. Death. V slowly has to accept that her choice to agree to Hanako's offer betrays everything she valued, loyalty being honored, fighting against the machine. After helping straighten the machine up again, her reward is being thrown in the loony bin as a lab rat. Get up. But a voice still lingers in her head reminding her of the fight still within her. It's only when V's allowed to talk to her friends that she finds it within herself to fight again. I just love the simplicity in what V's closest friends tell her. What am I supposed to do? Get a grip. Oh, if it sucks, come back down. Grab a shuttle and get your ass back home. No is a nice word. Beautiful sometimes. You should use it more often. They remind V of the choice and autonomy she still has. You don't have to play by the rules powerful forces give you. You don't have to give into their lowball offers. You can Please just say no. I love this ending because V comes out of it the most liberated. She faltered and was chained to the corporate machine. After false promises, she's presented an opportunity to live, but once again at the cost of selling her soul entirely to Arasaka. An offer that puts her at the mercy and property of an inhuman entity. Rejecting the contract means V is finally free. Free from the false hope Night City and its corporations present, V finally decides that she doesn't want to just survive, but live. Her future is uncertain, but for the first time in her life, V's future is finally in her own hands. As V gazes upon Earth from orbit, it's like she understands what life really means for the first time. What it means to find home. <laughs> I believe that the devil ending and the star ending play off each other in the same manner that the sun ending and temperance ending do. V was of course heavily affected by the death of Jackie, and she fears to lose someone else she cares for, especially in a mission for her own survival. The irony is that V has selflessly helped so many throughout the story without question as time was of the essence for her, yet she's afraid to ask for help in return. Despite everything, she questions if she's worth it and is surprised when Pan Am immediately agrees to help her. Okay. W okay. Where are you? I think I made the right choice playing the star ending last of the base game endings because it conveys a progression of V realizing just how much she's appreciated. The Aldecados accept her as one of her own after everything V has done for them and are willing to fight for one they consider family. With that though comes the pressure of being part of something. V seeing that it's not just her life on the line anymore, but others she cares for are putting it on the line so she can live. But that's the thing about family. You don't have to carry that weight alone. The best thing Jackie taught V wasn't how to become a legend, but reach a helping hand out to someone in need. V takes the time to pick up so many people throughout the story. V just had to learn how to take a helping hand in return again. The Aldecados accepting V allows her to see Night City from the outside for maybe the first time ever. See that it's terrifying in its comfort. Once the city seeps into your skin, it's hard to escape. It's easier to stay. It's easier to keep trying to solve the cube and play the game than deciding to change. The thought of running away seems like you're letting the city win. Its challenge was just too much and you weren't good enough. You chose the city as a home and you want to make it work. It's hard to leave home. But the truth is, Night City isn't a home but a prison. Running your dreams through the mud until you can't recognize them anymore and wonder why you dreamt them to begin with. A real home is a place where you're supported, appreciated, and loved. Night City could never provide that, and it's powerful seeing V choose to leave. Uncertainty is scary, but it's worse to live in depressing comfort. It's brave to take a step into the unknown. V dares to do something she thought Night City stomped out of her a long time ago. Dream. There it is. Night City. At your feet. The tower ending is something I genuinely dreaded doing after unlocking it. 
I already had the context going in that V would wake up after being in a coma for two years. My mind started racing thinking of the worst case scenario. I feared after all that time V's friends would move on from her and she wouldn't recognize the lives they lived now. When the time came to go to the roof above Misty's, I had this genuine sinking feeling in my stomach. Think this is it, kiddo. V's final moments with Johnny are the most bittersweet of all their goodbyes. There's no blaze of glory battle in Arasaka Tower, no Johnny making the journey to the other side with Alt. You make the sure bet choice for survival, and yet, there's still this sense of regret. Is this really the only way out? Johnny knows V feels this way and makes his strongest effort to ease his friend into the next phase of her life. Johnny can't tell V to never stop fighting because when she wakes up, the fight will be over. All he can tell her is to let go of that regret and stay true to herself no matter what's on the other side of the curtain. It may be my favorite moment with Johnny in the entire game. Johnny, I... Good night, Valerie. Today was a good day. V then wakes up and everything I feared about this ending is true, and then some. Not only has she lost two years of her life, but lost everything she's worked up for until now. V can no longer use implants. The life she loved as a merc in Night City, gone forever. Even if I can accept V never fighting again, what's still devastating is losing her chrome as a form of personal expression. It's not just a job that's been taken away from V, but part of her identity. In spite of V finally getting the help she's tirelessly sacrificed for, it still feels like another brick wall. <laughs> Same shit. Always. Peeps wanting to help me. Never being able to. Why? Only now, she seemingly has no one to lean on to for hope. Her friends are all in different places in life. A lot can change in tears, and it's fucking heartbreaking to see V lose so much in the blink of an eye for her. Everything has changed except Night City itself, and V expects to find comfort in that, but how can she when she can't thrive in it like she could before? All V's left with now is regret and thinking about what if. Maybe V deserves this. After damning so me to a hopeless future, that is exactly what she received in the end. Is life really worth living if you've been stripped of everything that makes you whole? V's light at the end of the tunnel blackened again because of her own choices. This ending hit home for me the hardest. Last year, I moved away from my childhood home and I felt like my life was totally upended. My dream career aspirations put on hold, my friends just out of reach for me to be as close to them as I want. I felt like I had to do so much in a short amount of time to justify my life. Get a full-time job, finally move out from my parents. It all became so overwhelming and I questioned every day if I could do it. Would all my effort ever be worth it? I began thinking about all the things I regret I never did in my old hometown. Why did I never ask the girl I really liked out? Why didn't I try harder to stay close to my childhood friends? Why didn't I try harder to break into the career field I really wanted to sooner? I had never felt more depressed in my life, and I still do sometimes to this day. How do I keep up with everything that's changing? You have been keeping up. You've made an impact. Not a single thing in this world isn't in the process of becoming something else. Likewise, you... Seeing V's life turned so upside down though, I think it's such a Herculean feat that by the end of this closing sequence, I felt hope walking away from this curtain call. V encounters Misty, who has changed a lot herself, but unlike some of V's old friends, for the better. Misty's moved on from Night City and is finally committing to a life elsewhere. V seems unconvinced she can follow suit, but Misty tells her the truth. V's faced brick walls in life before and broke through all of them. She reminds V that she's still young. V is now 25 years old, which is same age as me at the time of making this video. V may have lost a life she had, but that doesn't mean she can't build a new one she can be just as happy with if not more. But most importantly, V learns that she can't yearn for the past anymore. Living with perpetual regret can't help you now. Life will always knock you down, but it's up to you to stand back up and keep walking. I was left astonished by this ending. For as hopeless as it begins, it still ends on one of the most promising endings to the story. One dream may have been shattered for V, but she still has her whole life ahead of her to dream a new dream. V will never become a legend, but she accepts it's okay to just be another face in the crowd and that she can find happiness in there. This is the ending that gave me the most hope that life will get better. The world isn't over, and I can still find my happiness. Come a long way to get here, haven't we? I could have never guessed Cyberpunk 2077 would have gone from a game I mocked to being one of the most important pieces of art I've ever experienced. 
I don't believe in video game redemption stories. This should release in a strong state at launch, but regardless, I'm glad this game is finally in a place where it can be praised without asterisks. So much of me doesn't want to let this game go. With Project Orion in the distance, I would really like it to continue V's story in some form. It'd be difficult with the multiple endings, but not impossible in my opinion. Deep down though, I know there's a strong likelihood that this is it for V, and although I understand it, it saddens me nonetheless. Some stories don't get a happy ending for the credits roll. Leaving questions you're never gonna find the answers to. I'm just not ready to leave these characters in this world behind. Yeah, I know I can just replay the game and trust me, I have to stop myself constantly from starting a new game because I do actually want to play other things, believe it or not. It's just... <sighs> withdrawal syndrome. <laughs> sort of. There's just part of me that feels like when I finish this video that I'm letting this game go. But nothing's meant to last forever and nothing you cherish this much ever really leaves you. If this really is the end of V's story though, then she made that everlasting impression she longed for. V is now one of my all-time favorite protagonists. Cyberpunk is one of the best examples I can give that when all the pieces come together, there is no other art form that can match the impression video games can leave on you. The greatest weapon a good video game narrative has is time. You spend countless hours in the shoes of someone else and bonding with characters that it starts to feel like more than just pressing buttons. It's only ironic how the story of Cyberpunk so greatly captures how our time is limited. To cherish the bonds we have and if we're unhappy, to not accept it. If something isn't working for you, you don't have to grind yourself into the ground to make it work. It's okay to start fresh and seek happiness elsewhere. The way this game delivers those messages will always stick with me. In the end, all I can say now is thank you to the entire staff at CD Projekt Red for not giving up on this game. Thank you to the wonderful voice cast for bringing these amazing characters to life. And thank you Cyberpunk 2077 for being there for me when I needed you the most. All night city. Good night and good luck. <laughs>